Hello and welcome to The Print. Today we have with us Karki Kekra and Sabya Suma. We will be talking about the documentary Azmaish. It released in 2017 and is now streaming on Eventscape. Uh, Karki Kekra is a prominent Indian actor and Sabya Suma is an eminent director from Pakistan, having directed the acclaimed Kamosh Pani and Good Morning Karachi amongst others. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. So I think I recently saw the documentary and from the top of what I can gauge is that, it, that there's sort of a duality in uh, what, what it's depicting. On one front, it's, uh, like there is a documentary about friendship, which is trying to traverse the great India-Pakistan divide. And on the other, uh, you're, you're bringing up sort of themes of growing intolerance in both countries. So um, I want to begin by asking you, how and where did the idea of formulating such a documentary come about? And secondly, when did you realize that India and Pakistan could be on a similar trajectory of religious and cultural intolerance? And how did you decide that this should be the focus of uh, uh, making filmmaking? So to begin with, um, you know, I'm a frequent traveler to India. I've lived in India for several years. My parents came from Bombay. So there is a lot of connection between myself, my family and India, at least, um, you know, as I grew up, I was very familiar with India. My father was in politics. So uh, the debate at home would always be along, around political idioms and how India was defining itself, how Pakistan you know, was moving towards a religious identity and so on. Um, so I was quite familiar with all this. And uh, when I lived in India, I also saw the growth of the Hindu right wing in the time that I was there. It was happening slowly but surely. And at that time, not many people were willing to recognize it, but um, because I had been observing over such a long period, it, it, um, it threatened, you know, it, it threatened the idea of the secular India that I knew and I had grown up with. And, um, and then in 2014, the first elections that brought in Mr. Modi were a real culmination of those threats that I had felt. They, you know, I had surmised the worst and my worst, uh, the worst was happening. So at that time, I had already moved back to Pakistan. And, and then looking from here, but having been an insider, it gave me quite an understanding and I could compare it to Pakistan very easily. Um, and because if from Pakistan, the more secular minded liberal people had always looked to India as as, as hope, you know, as a possibility that the subcontinent can exist like this. So, and then started the idea that maybe putting these two countries together and seeing how they were actually having started on very different grounds, one secular, one religious, they were actually converging. And why can't it be that India actually learns a lesson from Pakistan and doesn't take that route because once intolerance takes root, uh, it's very hard to fight that, you know, and over generations, people's mindset changes, which is what I've witnessed in Pakistan. So, so just for like a brief time, and would you put like, say, 2014 as sort of like this pivotal point where you think that, you know, now we have these two diverging threads which could sort of now overlap, and this is where we should sort of start the process? Yes, because, you know, for a film, you always need a hook, right? Um, it can't be built on your vague feelings and uh, you need a hook. And Mr. Modi's electoral victory was that hook. Karki, what about you? Any thoughts on this? Yeah? I mean, um, you know, when Sabia asked me about taking part in this documentary, uh, I was firstly very interested just because I think our countries are so similar. I had not been to Pakistan. I was excited about going to visit. Um, 
And I think this whole idea of uh, people who have, I don't know what, some 90% similarities in genes, in, in culture and customs that are, you know, enemies was very, it didn't sit right with me. And I wanted to know more about it and I was curious. So that's why I joined her. And, um, and of course, with the uh, rising of, of right wing Hindutva and the idea of Hinduism being what represents India, I was, I was concerned. I, you know, grew up in a family where I was introduced to many religions. Um, you know, I went to a, a sort of Christian school, but I had parents who are devotees of the Aurobindo Ashram. Um, so, you know, I, I, I was exposed to different cultures and different religions. And I, I found that always part of my life in a lot of people, you know, uh, around me in India. Um, you know, we would go to our Muslim neighbor's house for Eid and they would come to our house for Christmas. And it was very, uh, you know, like easy to mix. So I was concerned about this idea that, you know, we have to start identifying ourselves with only one religion and only one identity. So just as a follow up, I was wondering, so did this sort of project come up together with both of you, like just sort of talking about it or did it happen? Like, so where did you first sort of think of it and then did you come on board later? Is that how it went out? Um, yes, I mean, I was already thinking about it. I had started shooting with the elections in 2013 in Pakistan. But that was that was not really, I, I didn't know where that material would go. And then 2014, and I think I met Kalki in 2015. Beginning of 2014, I think, yeah. Yeah, something like that. So the idea was already there. And then it grew stronger because I had a sounding board. You know, we could connect on what was happening and she was concerned. So it, it germinated earlier, but it came together and became more focused with Kalki on board. So, um, so given that the documentary first came out about five years ago, and there are like a broad set of themes that you, that you bring up, uh, or the maskas which you talk about, say whether it's religious intolerance, whether there's corruption, Judaism, gender inequality, um, how do you think the two countries have broadly sort of progressed or digressed on them since whoever would want to start? Well, I think some of the uh, prophetism of Sabia has come true. Uh, you know, that more and more the, the sort of fundamentalism of uh, Hindutva is, is showing through. Um, you know, in the different policy changes, the, the, the uh, arrests of journalists, of students. Um, so we are seeing this intolerance that's building up. Uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's one of those places, it's one of those things that are very hard to, to kind, of, kind of predict the future of just because of the enormous country that we are and things take a long time to, to move and but there is also an awakening to it both internationally and within the country so it is um it is to watch and wait it's, it's hard to say what's going to happen sabia what about you from a perspective for pakistan I've watched this process of intolerance growing and uh, being more and more acceptable to people. People turning around and saying, but we are Muslims. So we should behave as Muslims. You know, we should live out our lives as Muslims. And, um, and that it is the better religion. And it is, uh, you know, if everyone were to convert to Islam, that would be the best thing they could do for themselves that people can't, uh, you know, decide for themselves what is good is, is just not accepted anymore. Um, so the state is going to decide and tell everyone 
and then everyone should follow. Um, and I felt a similar kind of vibe in in India when uh, Kalki was talking to the BJP uh, cadre in in a in a park, and they said, "But but we are all Hindus. That is our identity." And everybody who says, uh, you know, they are Hindus are with us. Not to mention who doesn't say. You see, so the net is really tightening, and it's a threat to it's a veiled threat to those who are not part of that clique. So uh, through the documentary, uh, there is also like when you're speaking in Pakistan. Uh, you 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 go to a village and you talk to them whether they have access to healthcare or education, and their response is that no, that we don't have anything, and we would like there to be uh, some sort of development on these fronts. Uh, do you feel that sort of in this time has has there been any progress on these sort of broad themes? Any any divergence of feudalism, sort of more democratic oriented growth? Well, something has to give. That is, that is, uh, it's a race against time, I think. But currently, I don't feel that tension, you know. Um, but historically speaking, change can come only through discontent, and the leadership then leading and directing that discontent. Towards a better or more progressive society, that leadership is missing at the moment. But um, there's still hope that it might happen. Kalki uh, Simri, what about you? Any thoughts on similar themes of, say, healthcare, education, development in India or in Pakistan? Either. I don't think I I I couldn't really observe Pakistan because I've only been for that trip with mm-hmm. Sabia. Um, I think that here we are already, we were more democratized, more industrialized. Um, at the same time, I feel like India has so many je- kinds of Indias, you know, you still have very rural, very poor areas where people are still walking miles to get water. Um, and then you have places like Bombay and Delhi where you have access to these things so it is it is really hard to see it as one you know body um, and it's it's both the thing that's our strength and our weakness I feel uh, you know at the and the idea that uh, we are so diverse and that's why we can't just be one identity um, and that we can accept multiplicity, but at the same time, because we are so diverse and there's so much gap between certain places um, and the development of certain areas and, and, and how much abundance there is in other areas, there's, there's this dissatisfaction. And that is why the people are looking for other answers. Uh, and probably why the BJP came into power. So, yeah. I, I specifically wanted to talk about how the documentary begins. Um, actually, it's rather the second scene where somewhere you take a trip to a sort of feudal grandeur and politicians, Paris, and um, where Mr. Mr. Mahar, and you, you start talking to him about gender political discourse and, and his work. And, and 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 in one of the sort of exchanges, he says that women have no place in our active politics. And the next day you meet his son and he says the same, that in our everyday interactions, the females of the family don't, don't, don't meet the public. Um, so I, I wanted to ask, how did you take those comments specifically given the fact that this documentary plays quite an important role in sort of uh, dismantling these really male dominated discourses on uh, India Pakistan relations and overall in sort of the nuances of the country. So, just your thoughts. Well, one of the things that always strikes me when I'm doing a film uh, in Pakistan is that 
it becomes feminist by virtue of the fact that I'm the only woman amongst men all the time, everywhere. And, um, and it's very hard for me to access women uh, for my camera. Um, I, I feel that when I can have a conversation with someone like Mr. Mahar or Peer Pagara or any of those um, political figures, I am probing and I am questioning and, and that is my role as a filmmaker to continue to do that. Um, but whether I can actually, uh, you know, and, and, and I think that by staying within that, uh, by, by, by staying within that, I'm also communicating to the audience the difficulties that I am facing as well, because I'm in my films. And then there is a scene in where, which was just, it just happened because we, our car broke down actually. And we went to, went into a village because it was going to take some time to repair it. And, and there I just started talking to a woman spontaneously because she was out there, you know, I didn't go into a, into a room to interview her. This is the lady, sorry, this is the lady with the hand pump, right? In that scene. Yes. Yeah. yes. And then I started um, talking to her and I knew she understood Urdu and I knew that she could speak to me also, but she couldn't speak until she had the men's uh, permission to speak to me. And she knew that she wouldn't get that permission. So she shied away and she said something and then she was a bit wary and then the man... Uh, stepped in and told me to get out of their village and so on. So it was just coincidence that we, we got that scene. It was never planned, but it was a very good demonstration of what is the larger problem in the country. You know, the sooner everyone realizes that women are and must be visible, uh, you know, part of the country, the sooner they realize it, the better for everyone. You know, because I feel that in our societies, men are suffering a lot as well. I mean, if you look at any Pakistani drama, although they talk about the submissive role for women and women are being beaten and women are being disregarded and disrespected, but I think that also shows you that the men who are beating them are not happy men, right? There are also men who are deeply unhappy and deeply disconnected with their own humanity. And that's how I see this whole society, that it is a very unhappy place because nobody is fulfilled. Nobody has the satisfaction of being who they truly are. And there's no possibility to achieve that. You know, it's a, we are not in a good place. And I just think that scene uh, with the hand pump in the village is, uh, if, it's, if it just came about while you were there, I think it's really telling of uh, where things at least were. And uh, I, I think if everybody should just try and observe that and try and understand what really happens. Um, I don't think we have that here. And I think that's actually one of the arguments of the right wing that we are helping our women and, you know, they're coming out and working and we don't, it's not the same kind of fundamentalism as Islamic. But it does take generations to get to a point, right? Um, and we are at the, at the beginning of this uh, place. And it's, it's a very, yeah, it's a very tricky, tricky situation where women are becoming empowered Women are going out, they're getting educated, they're going out and working, they're earning. But it's, you can see the rise in violence towards women, extreme rise in violence towards women in India. And, and it's almost like a kind of a, a threat to the power of the patriarchy. Um, and so where will that clash go in the next generation, um, you know, is, 
is an interesting thing to to watch. Um, where would where will the, the children that we have brought up in a in a more so let's say more conservative, less democratic society, um, how are they going to get raised? Um, you know, it is an interesting place that we're in, and I'm yeah, I'm worried. Well, moving on, I, I'd like to talk about towards the end of the documentary. Uh, you both sort of came this footage, I think, which is near the India-Pakistan border somewhere. Is, is that where it is? Yeah. Uh, so, yes. so uh, like you, you, you sort of came the thing talk and you try and look towards the future or where, where could there be any sort of convergences between both the countries? Uh, so, I, I just want to ask, uh, looking ahead, since then. Uh, has there been anything which has made you hopeful for sort of a better tomorrow in both the countries? Um, it's hard to say at the moment because I think both countries are in a very difficult position at the moment. And uh, even the little communication that we had earlier has kind of completely stopped. There is no traffic between or people to people exchange between India and Pakistan anymore. Um, and that I think is going to take a toll on both countries. Um, <clears throat> but there is always hope, there has to be, right? So, but sometimes generations, as Kalki said, uh, can pass, you know, before that hope really surfaces and uh, culminates in anything concrete. So at the moment, we might need to brace ourselves for a period of, um, of, of silence, darkness, um, because with the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan, the Hindutva in India, a very strong army in Pakistan, and the Taliban presence here. I don't know what will give way. Hard to say. Okay, any thoughts on that? Okay. Yeah, it's amazing how, uh, you know, we still somehow have hope. As long as we're alive, we have hope, I think. And that's, that's the basic biology of survival. Um, you know, because we're seeing all over the world terrible things happening at the moment. Um, fundamentalism and rising everywhere. Um, and, and basic humanity being disregarded. Um, uh, but as, as long as there's life growing, uh, people will fight for their basic needs. And of course, the basic needs are, you know, clean air and water and, and shelter and food, but also basic needs are friendship and communication. Um, and, you know, I think these are things that will eventually rise above everything else. And you, it does, when you go through a period of, as you said, darkness, or the others, it takes a long time to get there. But, uh, these are the basic needs you need for survival, for you know some kind of contentment in life, and yeah, we'll get there eventually. Hopefully. Um, so, just before we run out of time, I wanted to ask like, more like, from a logistical viewpoint: uh, how how difficult or complicated was it to get the permits and the visas to have this sort of cross border shooting? which is now pretty rare uh, anyway. Yeah, <clears throat> I couldn't imagine doing this now in this climate, but um, it was possible at that time. It did take a while, but um, also that Kalki is French, maybe that helped, I don't know. You know of course. Well -known. Yeah, and she's a very well-known Indian actress. So, you know, her identity is, is that really, but um, we, we had to just be very um, strong about it and um, 
push, keep pushing it. Um, and, and, you know, between India and Pakistan, there is always, or at least up to a point, I don't know if it's true now, but the ambassadors always have discretionary powers, you know. And at that time, there was still that feeling of let people go and come and let, uh, let there be some exchange. Um, there was a little bit of an open-mindedness. So I'm glad that we got it done when we did. So uh, I think that pretty much brings us to the end of our time. And uh, thank you so much for such a great discussion. And, uh, and I hope that people can really, since it's online now, go see it, imbibe it, and try and sort of think like, a bit critically about the themes you raise. Um, thank you very much for joining us at the print. Thank you, Sajid. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.